word margin, what comes to your mind? You might say, well, oh, margin, I melt that in my potatoes. <laughs> That's something different. When we think of the word margin, we might think back to our school days, right? And your teacher always told you not to write in the margin. You have that little one inch little on the sides, you know, leave a nice margin so that your work that you, so that your writing is attractive. But the word margin has taken a, de a different definition these days. Now we use the word margin as referring to, to having a margin in our lives, meaning that our lives aren't packed so tightly that we don't have room for anything else to come into the picture. Uh, we might say, we might complain that we have no margin in our schedules. In other words, we're so busy that we just don't have time to get together with that friend or to go out with our family or to take that vacation or do what we like to do. We just don't have time. We don't have margin in our schedules. We, we might uh, say that we don't have margin in our finances. Like we're, we're living paycheck to paycheck so that we're, we're okay. But like if anything goes wrong, if something unexpected happens, we're in trouble, right? Because we don't have margin. We don't have free cash flow. We might talk about that we don't have emotional margin in our lives. In other words, I'm just kind of hanging on the edge and the slightest thing can cause me to break down emotionally because I've got it held together this moment, but there's no margin. And so if something else happens, I'm afraid I'm going to lose control. Margin is something that we struggle with as a society today. But that word margin is also in the word marginalized. And so today's message is entitled, God is Reaching the Marginalized. As we're working through the Gospel of Mark, having done experiencing God a year ago, we're talking about where is God at work? How do we see God at work in the Gospel of Mark? And so today we're going to talk about we see God reaching the marginalized through Jesus Christ. Now that word marginalized, what that means is people that are usually overlooked, people that are on the fringes of society, people that we may not think much about because maybe we don't interact with them very much, or the people that are often left out. And we see in Jesus' ministry that he spent a lot of time doing ministry among those that were the marginalized the overlooked, the poor, the spiritually disconnected, the diseased, the unclean. And here, as we're going to see today, he's doing ministry among the Gentiles. So we are in Mark chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 24 through 30. It says, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Interesting story. We hear Jesus use some words we may not expect Jesus to use. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to start when it says that Jesus went to the vicinity of Tyre. Now, Tyre was the name of a city that had a complicated history with Jewish people. First of all, it was a Phoenician city. Uh, I've got a couple of slides. We can go to the next slide, uh, please. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is a map of the Mediterranean area, right? So this is Spain and Europe, Asia Minor, and here's Palestine. This is where Jesus, you know, lived. Jerusalem's right there. And Tyre is just a little bit up the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, right about here, 
on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and it was a Phoenician city. The Phoenicians are an empire we don't really talk a lot about. They were just along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. They had several different cities, and they didn't really go inland. They were just a trading empire. They were the Wall Street brokers of the ancient world. They had wonderful ships that took goods all over the place, and although they didn't have a big empire, they had a very wealthy empire. And the city of Tyre was a very wealthy city historically because they would take things from, you know, Arabia and from uh, Persia and they would send them across to Europe and North Africa and they were trading all over the place. Tyre at one point made peace with King David and with King Solomon. They had kind of a peace treaty. In fact, when Solomon built the temple, he used lumber provided by the city of Tyre. He used Gentile wood to build the Jewish temple. I find that interesting. However, the city of Tyre was also credited, unfortunately, with introducing the worship of the false god Baal to Israel, and so it had a negative spiritual impact on Jewish people. And eventually the city of Tyre became so wicked that God singled her out in Ezekiel chapter 26, where God prophesied in detail how he was going to destroy the city of Tyre. We'll actually go to the next slide, because this is kind of a, uh, maybe a rabbit trail from the point of my message, but this is one of my I'm a big apologetics guy, like in defending the faith, and the historical fulfillment of prophecy I find incredible. Because Ezekiel 26, what the prophet talks about, it's amazing how it literally takes place. I want to spend just a couple of moments to talk about what God said. You can turn to Ezekiel 26 if you want. I'm not going to turn there, but if you want to read, sometime read Ezekiel 26, it's incredible. But God, first of all, says that he's going to bring many nations against the city of Tyre in Ezekiel 26. And that is fulfilled. First of all, uh, Babylon comes and destroys the city of Tyre. And then a little bit later on, Alexander the Great the, of the Greek Empire comes. He destroys them again. And then there's kind of some peace for a little bit. But then about 800 AD, a group of Muslims comes and completely wipes out the city. And it's uninhabited for about 1,200 years. The next thing that, that God prophesied about Tyre is that the mainland city of Tyre would be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Ezekiel actually names this Nebuchadnezzar, the guy that's already causing trouble. He's going to come against Tyre, and he's going to destroy it. And surely enough, eventually Nebuchadnezzar comes. He lays siege to Tyre for 13 years. Keeps the city under siege. But what happens is the people of Tyre were, were, not, were no dummies. And there was an island about a half mile offshore. And so what they were doing during those 13 years, they were sneaking away to that island and rebuilding their city on the island because Nebuchadnezzar did not have a navy. He didn't really have a good way to reach them. Uh, so when, after 13 years, after Nebuchadnezzar finally broke down the walls, he found the city largely uninhabited because they'd all escaped. The rich people, at least, had all escaped to the island. It's, but Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city. Tore down every brick, every stone, completely wiped it out, just as God had promised. Then in Ezekiel 26, God says that the debris from Tyre would be thrown into the water. And it's really cool what happened after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. A couple hundred years later, Alexander the Great comes along. Now, where are the people living at this point? Are they on the mainland? No, they're on the island. And so, Alexander the Great comes by with his mighty phalanx, and he's going to try to destroy Tyre. Oh no, he doesn't have a name either. <laughs> and so the people of the, of the island of Tyre, ah, they're making fun of him. You can't get us. Alexander the Great, though, he says, wait a minute, we've got all these stones from the city. He takes the stones, he throws them into the ocean, builds a bridge to the island. Fulfilling what God said about that the rubble would be thrown into the sea, Alexander uses that to build a bridge, a causeway to the island city, and then completely wipes out the city. And the stones from that causeway are still visible in, in Tyre today. Next, thing, God says that the city of Tyre, the island of Tyre, would become a place where, excuse me, where people would spread, fishermen would spread, spread their fish nets to dry. And Mark Twain, when he was 
tour in the Middle East, he wrote in his own personal journal about how incredible it was to see this prophecy fulfilled as he looked and he saw fishermen's nets drying in the ruins of ancient Tyre. God then also says that the city would never be rebuilt. Here's where sometimes skeptics say, uh, but Jeff, uh, the city of Tyre was rebuilt. The original site has not been built on. There is a city there today called Tyre that's around it. It's not a big city, but the prophecy was fulfilled because the point of the prophecy was that Tyre is never going to be glorious again. It's never going to be wealthy. It's never going to be a prominent city in the, in the world. And Tyre today is just another town. It's there, but it's not great like it was. It has fallen. So God prophesied in detail what it would happen in Tyre. And so that's all kind of in the background when we come to Mark chapter 7. This is where Jesus goes. This place where um, they were at some point friends with Israel, but then God was so angry with them that he specified how he was going to judge them in the scriptures. And that had been fulfilled. And so now there is a group... Uh, Jesus is going not to the city itself, but to that vicinity. But just so we have some context. So why does Jesus go there? Well, it says in verse 24, um, he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence a secret. Is he trying to go there for a big public ministry, big revival? No. He's going to rest. It's amazing, as I've preached through so far the Gospel of Matthew, or excuse me, the Gospel of Mark, how many times in the Gospel of Mark all Jesus is doing is looking for a nap? Like, anybody identify with that? Like, he's just trying to get some rest. Everywhere he goes, there's a crowd, so he goes someplace else to try to get away a little bit and, and get time with his disciples and rest and vacation, and it doesn't matter. And once again, we see the same thing here, right? But he's also going there to teach his disciples. So he goes to Gentile territory. Why? Because in Galilee... They're already trying to kill Jesus. We'll get into this more next week. So he's trying to get away because the temperature is getting a little bit too hot in Galilee. So he wants some time to teach his disciples. Now, what do we know about this woman that, that comes to Jesus in this story? Well, the first thing we know is that she's Greek. Mark says it very clearly. She's fully Gentile. She's of Syrian Phoenicia. She's a uh, Phoenician in the fact that she's uh, descended from the, those people, the Phoenicians. In Roman territory, that means that she's Syrian, because that's what the, Syria was the name that the Romans gave to that territory. But she's not Jewish. She's fully Gentile, living in a Roman territory. Matthew, in his telling of the story, gives a different word for her. He uses the word Canaanite, says that she is a Canaanite, which Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, would have had a particular meaning because the Canaanites were people that the Jews despised. It brought to mind for the Jewish person horrible wickedness. In fact, that's what God said through Moses. You're supposed to destroy all of the Canaanites. Wipe them out. Now, the Jews didn't, and that caused them trouble. Why? Because the people of Tyre and that area would introduce Baal worship to the Jews. According to the Jews, this woman should have expected nothing from God because of who she descended from. She was of a despised class. The second thing we know about this woman, this seems silly, but she's a woman. That was easy. You got a bed for this? But remember, we've talked about this. Women in Jewish society had almost no standing. A woman's testimony could not be considered in court because they were just considered untrustworthy. But what's interesting is that even though we look at the Jewish uh, culture in the first century and say, man, they treated women so horribly, the truth is they treated women much better than most of the people around them. They did have rights then. They were despised, looked down on, but they did have rights, unlike many of the nations around them. But still, as a non-Jewish woman, she had no standing in the eyes of men. The third thing that we know is that she was desperate. It says here that her, whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit, that word little daughter we've seen before, 
It's also shown in Mark 5.23, if you remember, Jairus' daughter, the one that Jesus raised from the dead. And we talked about how that word doesn't mean necessarily just young daughter. It's precious. It's my little girl. That's the word Jesus uses. Her little girl, her precious angel, was possessed by a demon under the control of Satan. Even in a non-Jewish setting, she may have been considered cursed by her neighbors. Her neighbors may have abandoned this woman. I don't want anything to do with your daughter. Something's wrong. It's interesting that a husband is not mentioned in this passage. Now, that doesn't mean she didn't have one. It doesn't mean she didn't have a good husband, but it might mean that maybe dad's not a part of the picture. Maybe she's a single, single mother. Maybe she's a widow. We don't know. But we kind of get the picture that she's probably fairly isolated. She has nowhere to turn until she comes to Jesus. It says in verse 25 that she heard. As soon as she heard about Jesus, she heard. Somebody told her Jesus was in town. Somebody told her who Jesus was. How many people around us are just like this woman? They need somebody to tell them about Jesus. They're desperate. They're downtrodden. They don't know where to turn. They need to hear there's a Savior in town who's willing to help. And so she goes to the house where Jesus is staying and throws herself at his feet. And I love the way that Mark describes it. Mark, or excuse me, Matthew describes it. Uh, Matthew 15, verses 22 and 23. It gives a little bit more detail about the way this goes. It says, A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. And then this, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. This is not like a, hey, can you help me please? And then a quick ignoring of it. She's over and over again pleading, Son of David, help me. Jesus, rescue me. My daughter is in trouble. And the disciples eventually are just like, I can't take this woman screaming anymore. Jesus, just send her away. It's too much. The disciples get annoyed. Now, of course, this seems insensitive to us, right? This woman's in need. And the disciples are just like, make her leave. But understand, this is the culture they live in. This wasn't just a woman, this was a Gentile woman. They have no right to come to a rabbi, a respected rabbi, and ask for anything. So they say, tell, tell Jesus, make her leave. And, and by the way, they're in the middle of something. They're trying to relax. Trying to get a, a vacation. And it's interesting that she calls Jesus the son of David. Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on my daughter, son of David. That's interesting because that's a title for the Messiah. She's not Jewish. How does she know this son of David term? Somebody, she somehow learned who the son of David is supposed to be. Whether it was her own conclusion or somebody else told her, this is Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah. It's a, it's a term that occurs several times in the gospel, but interestingly, only in the, the telling of this story here in Mark 7 and Matthew 15, it's the only times in Scripture the word Son of David is spoken by a Gentile. Isn't that cool? She understands that Jesus is the one, the Son of David, who's going to restore the Jewish kingdom, the one that the Jews have been hoping for for a long time. Now, how does Jesus respond? Kind of a shocking response when you think about it. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Ouch! My kids would say, burn! <laughs> Why does Jesus say something like this? I mean, he's essentially calling her a dog. Keep in mind, this is probably the way Jesus' disciples would expect a good Jewish man to respond to this situation. Probably the way that most Jewish people would have responded. But really what's happening here, I think Jesus is testing her faith. He's trying to gauge 
the level of her trust, the level of her need, and whether she's really, what she really believes about him. But one thing that's interesting here is that Jesus, the Jews would often call Gentiles dogs. All the Gentiles are dogs. But the term that most Jews would use to refer to Gentiles was the kind of, it was the term for dog that referred to the wild dog, the scavengers that would roam through town, wanted nothing to do with anybody, right? I don't know if we ever use the word feral to describe dog. It's more of a cat term, right? But essentially they're feral dogs that, that are worthless. That's the word most Jews would use to describe the Gentile. Jesus doesn't use that word though here. The word that Jesus uses for dog here refers to the, the little puppy pets that we have in the house. It's a word that refers to a dog that's a part of the family. A dog that you love and you care for and you take care of. But let's be honest, when I feed my kids supper at night, I'm not like, okay, Aaron, here, Eva, uh, here, all of my kids, here's your supper. But wait, don't eat yet. Let me first give this one to Sarah <laughs> and Odie. Right? This makes sense to us. We don't feed the dogs the entree before we feed our children. So it's interesting to me that Jesus doesn't use the word of, of scavenger dogs. It's the dogs that are a part of the family, but there's an order to things here. He's not really being quite as insulting as it may seem to us. By the way, you know, there's a difference between dogs and cats, I've found. Like, we have these chihuahuas, right? And they're not the smartest animals, but they are, for the most part, they're patient for their food. Like, they don't get on the table. They do sometimes, if, if you're not watching, uh, they'll jump up there in order to get some scraps if they're up there, but they know they're in trouble if they get caught. The cats, they get on the table, they don't care if they're on the table. They think they deserve to be up on the table with the kids, right? In ancient Egypt, you know, they worshiped cats as gods. I think it's because cats believe that they are gods and the Egyptians were just dumb enough to go along with it, right? But dogs are generally, they know they're going to get their food eventually, so they're willing to wait. Anyways, Jesus' words, first the children, first we feed the children, meaning the Jewish people, and then the Gentiles. It's really consistent, actually, with what the gospel says. In fact, Romans 1.16, Paul writes this to a group of mostly Gentile Christians in Rome. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. There's an order to things that's really right in line with what Jesus is really saying to this woman here. First salvation, the gospel goes to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. It's always been God's plan. <laughs> Even back in the Old Testament, when he rescued his people out of, the prom or out of Egypt, sent them to the promised land, the whole goal was that God reveals his word and his holiness, his message to Israel, and that Israel would be a light to the nations. The nations would look to Israel and say, wow, there's something about their God. There's something about this teaching that maybe we should be influenced by the Jewish people. But unfortunately, Israel didn't go that way. They allowed themselves to be influenced by the nations around them. And so it kind of broke down. So now Jesus comes. He, and he comes. He brings the gospel. He brings salvation. His message, though, is first to the Jews. He does some ministry among the Gentiles, but primarily his message is first to the Jews, and then the plan is that it's going to go to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. It's always been God's plan. And so his message essentially is, look, it's not your turn yet. We'll get to you. But note her persistence. What she says here. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. In other words, there's got to be mercy and grace for me, even now. Just like crumbs that fall from the table, there's got to be something for me today. Note her persistence. Are there any crumbs of mercy for a starving puppy? Jesus is floored by this. In fact, it says in Matthew 15, 28, in Matthew's telling of it, 
Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. You have great faith. There's only two times in the Gospels where Jesus comments on somebody's great faith. Here, and in the story of the Roman centurion. Remember the guy who had a servant that was sick, and Jesus says, okay, I'll go and I'll heal him. And the Roman says, no, wait. I know you've got the authority. Just speak the words. He's going to be healed. You don't have to come with me. Just say it here because I know how authority works. And Jesus says, you have great faith. Only two times in the Gospels, Jesus compliments somebody's great faith. And both of them are for Gentiles. Amazing, isn't it? Here and then also the Roman centurion. And so sure enough... Jesus says, yes, you have great faith. You may go. The woman returns home. She finds that the demon is gone from her daughter. She's resting well, and now mom is overjoyed. So what do we learn from this woman this morning? The message is this. No one is beyond the reach of Jesus. No one is beyond the reach of Jesus. Because many others, probably Jesus' disciples included, would have assumed that she's the wrong ethnicity. She's the wrong race. The wrong gender. She's lived in the wrong area. We're, we're, not at, we're on vacation. We're not at home here. And salvation doesn't leave Israel. What did she have? She had faith. She had faith in the Son of God. She believed that because of who Jesus was, he would want to help her in any way that he could. And so she left, not disappointed. Do we ever assume that there's people that are beyond the reach of God? It's not that we think that God doesn't want to save them. We know that God desires that none will perish, but all come to repentance, all come to salvation. But do we maybe assume that there's people out there they're just not going to respond? Or they're, they're not interested. Maybe there's too many piercings, too many tattoos. Or have you seen people that just they just look angry? Like I don't, I don't know if I want to talk to them about Jesus because I can tell there's a lot of anger there and I'm just, they're going to, I don't know what they're going to do, but it's not going to be pleasant when they speak back to me. Or maybe there's somebody that we've tried to be a witness to them. We've tried to tell them about Jesus and they shot us down so violently we're like, whoa, okay, well, not doing that again. And we just assume that they're always in that state of close-minded to the truth. We just assume that they remain Hard heart. We have to be careful what we assume because nobody is beyond hope. And God may be working in the life and the heart of somebody that we may not see at first. Or maybe even just for ourselves. Like, do we still see ourselves maybe as that woman who's looking for crumbs? Because maybe we come up with reasons why we shouldn't approach God with this request or this need. Because, oh, he's much too busy for that. I'm just looking for the crumbs. But understand, this is a story for a time. There's no longer any crumbs for anybody. God has now opened up the gospel, opened up the throne room to all people. We don't have to wait our turn anymore because Jesus has gotten rid of that dividing wall, Paul says in Ephesians. He's opened up the throne room to everybody. Ephesians 2, 17 and 18. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, that is Gentiles, and peace to those who are near, which is the Jews. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. In other words, nobody's under the table anymore looking for scraps. There's a great banquet waiting for anybody who will come. That includes us when we feel like Maybe this is a burden God doesn't want me to give to him because he's just got too much to do. And who am I, little old me? He couldn't possibly care about what I care about. No, he does. And it also applies to others that we may assume they're just not interested. All have access right now. This woman would have seemed to have been beyond reach to many people, but God was at work within her, and Christ saw her faith, 
So her family received healing because when she had the chance to respond, she did. So Lord, forgive us for the times that we limit your grace in our own minds, whether it's within ourselves, whether it's with other people. So this week, I want to challenge you. I want you to find, each day this week, I want you to, to find two people that you don't know where they stand with God. Maybe they're Christians. Maybe they're not. Maybe they have reason to think. Maybe they, they aren't yet a believer. They may seem far away. Pray for them. Two people each day. Pray for them. If you get a chance to bless them in Jesus' name, to be a witness to them, do that. Be Christ to them, because you do not know who God may be already drawing to himself. And as uh, Scott and Kim, you guys can come forward. We're going to close the worship in just a minute, but I want to I close with the story of a guy named, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, my Japanese is a little rusty. A Japanese man named Tokichi Ishii. He was a Japanese criminal who was sentenced to death because he was essentially a mass murderer. He killed lots of people. Men, women, children. The guy was a complete brute. He had no pity. He had no remorse over what he'd done. He was the guy, the Hannibal Lecter, that is portrayed as terrifying in his jail cell. There's a group of women from Canada that came to the Japanese prison in order to try to do ministry there. And when they came, they decided to go and visit him. But he wouldn't speak to them. He just gave them a look like he was a wild beast. He gave this wild man image to them. Totally closed. But they decided, you know what, we're going to leave a copy of the Bible here just in case at some point, he decides to read it. And he did. He read it. And eventually, he got to the story of Christ's crucifixion, and God softened his heart, and it led him to faith in Christ. He accepted the free gift of salvation, and he became a changed man. And later, when the day of his execution came, when the jailer took him to the gallows, the jailer thinking he's gonna, this is going to be this wild man, this horrible, awful murderer that would kill me if he had the chance. He found not a surly, hardened criminal, but instead, Tokichi was, he was smiling. He was radiant with the joy of God. He'd been born again. Born again. Now he had joy. Because God is in the habit of reaching people who have been pushed to the margins. As his servants, we should be about re bringing them into his family. Will you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you so much. You are the God who comes for those on the outs. Because we were on the outs. That's the gospel message. It doesn't matter whether we were Jewish or Gentile. We all had fallen short of your glory. We all were incapable of saving ourselves. And you came for us. Willingly giving your life on a cross to take the take the, the, the sin and the punishment that we deserve that punishment, but you took it upon yourself. You are a God who goes to those on the margins. So Father, I want to pray for those marginalized in our society, in our community. And Lord, your heart is for them to come to faith in Christ. So we pray for their salvation. We pray that you would give us opportunity to be Christ to them, whether it's in a conversation, in an act of service, maybe even just in a smile. But Lord, work in their lives, work in their hearts, and help us, Lord, to recognize when we have the opportunity to be Christ to them, because it is your desire that none should perish all come to repentance. And this woman in Mark 7, we don't know how she learned that you were the son of David, but she came to faith that you are the son of David. And she received healing for her daughter. And I believe eternal salvation for herself through her decision. So Lord, we just uh, pray that we can be salt and light in this earth. And that you would bring those to yourself who are at this point on the margins of Jesus' name.
you'll stand, please. We're going to sing God of Wonders. We have an incredible God who has created incredible things. Amen. 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 attention to like they got this new telescope out in space have you seen it in the pictures that have come like this brand new telescope is like much better than Hubble they've been able to see like way back farther into the universe than anybody's ever seen before and what I find interesting about it is what like you know they've got this whole big bang theory of how everything came about and it's like and then like everything came to be what they're finding is that these pictures it's like revealing things that go totally against that theory and now there's all these scientists saying, how in the world did all of this get here? Well, I've got some ideas, right? And isn't it amazing when we see the stars, when we see creation, the evidence of God's love and existence and character and care for us all over the place. We have a God that is beautiful in any way. And so this last song we're going to sing is, just says you're beautiful. Starting with creation and, and the stars above and the earth below and, and the cross. And then the promise that we have. We have a beautiful God. Amen. 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 Amen.
majesty and your power and for your promise. And Father, it's a salvation that we've come to experience as we respond to you. We believe that you are the Son of God who came into the world, who died on the cross for our sins, and that was raised from the dead on the third day to show that death is defeated. Amen. Death is dead. Amen. It no longer has power over us. And because of that, we have hope, and we have victory, and we have joy. And because of our faith, your Holy Spirit resides, takes up residence inside of us to equip us, Father, to take this gospel, this good news to a world that increasingly is dark that increasingly is fallen and alienated from the hope that we have. So use us, Father, to take this good news to a world that needs to know the beauty of the God who created each of us within the womb. Charge us to do that. Call us forward into the mission this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. We will see you next Sunday. At the park. Oh, wait, yeah. Wow. Yeah. How did I, I didn't even mention that earlier. Don't show up here next week. Show up at Sunnyside Park and invite those neighbors I was just praying about. Right? 10 o'clock, bring a lawn chair, Sunnyside Park. Thank you, Jan. We're doing announcements next week? Want to do announcements next week? No, okay. Have a best week.